Okay, so uh, we are now recording. Uh, first of all, uh, welcome everyone to um, to another session of IFKL Online workshop. And uh, this this month, we are very proud to have uh, Muli and Alex from the Satora team. Uh, and thank you so much, guys, for doing this. And um, another note from uh, from the speakers is that if feel free to ask any questions along the way. Just unmute yourself, and uh, we we'll see how it goes. If it gets too noisy. Uh, I will moderate, but uh, in the meantime, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, enjoy the, enjoy the talk. So uh, I guess um, Muni can take it away. Thank you very much, G. I, it's lovely to be here and to talk to you guys. Uh, I've been working on, on this domain for quite a long time, but I think this is the first time that I'm well, basically with the team trying to actually make a tool that everybody can use and actually this tool you will see later a demo. It's a tool for securing your code. It's already prevented billion dollars mistake and you are welcome to try the tool. So, uh, wait, I don't know. I'm on my, my screen. So uh, our team, we have actually assembled, this is a, a tool which has a lot of technology coming from uh, formal methods, which is a, a topic in computer science. And we have many, many experts in this domain who are helping us to actually make this tool real. These people have PhD from top school in, in the US, in Israel, in Europe, in many places. And they're actually they're using their skills to build actually this kind of technology. And uh, complementary to them, there's uh, some noise, maybe question, I don't know. No, okay. So there's complementary to the technology, we have the, the people who are actually the security experts who are helping to actually make this tool a real tool as part of checking the code security. And you will, you will uh, meet Alex Joseph. Basically, these are experts in security who are actually making this tool into a product that everybody can use. Uh, I'm sure I don't, this is not news put to you, but I want to point out that a lot of bugs in the space of crypto happens due to coding mistakes. And these are few bugs, but there are may, many more. Everybody knows the Nomad Bridge, which is a small change in the code. Also compound governance, which is actually also a small change in the code. And compound governance is interesting because they actually ask a customer of Satora, but somebody have changed the code without using the Satora code. So the idea is basically that you, are, you can have a lot of mistakes in the code, and, and this is something that Sertora is trying to prevent. So Sertora is not the only tool. There are different kinds of technologies to prevent uh, bugs or to find bugs before the code is deployed. All of them are useful. Let me point out high level the, the, the tool. So, the first technology that you can use is basically test, or even you can have automatic testing called fuzzing, that you basically try the, in, the tool on many, many inputs. And there are techniques like in the, in the area of general code, there is the American fuzzy law. And for smart contract, basically there is Enkidna, which is a tool by Trail of Bit, and there is Foundry, which is by Paradigm and Community. So these are fuzzing tools. They're basically doing testing that you can do before the code is deployed. This is very useful to basically try the tool and many inputs. Uh, the pro it is easy to use. The problem with this kind of technology is coverage, that if you have a bug, which is very, very hard, sort of deep bug and logical mistakes, it's a bit harder to find with this mistake, with this technology. The other te uh, technique that is useful and has been around also in the computer science for quite a while is static analysis. So static analysis, this is the idea that you basically check your code, you are, you are doing some, some search being syntactic or semantic to check your code. There are industrial tools like Coverity, uh, uh, Veracode, Checkmarks, White Source. In the area of blockchain, it's a, it's a smaller domain. There is tool Slitter by 12 bit, which is checks the code. How many of you know Slitter? Uh, everybody is muted. So Me, I know. Okay, good. So Slitter is a tool for smart contract. In, uh, and, and, and usually, and there's also other tools in this domain. So Torah Prover also has <coughs> some kind of specialized static analysis. 
The role of static analysis is the precision. Basically, because these tools are not aware of what you are doing, it's actually, they have very high level of false positive and false negative. And we are seeing it, and many people have seen that's sort of the limit of this kind of technology. The third technology, and this is what we're going to hear today, this is the Sertor approver. It's called automatic formal verification. Sometimes it's referred to as deductive verification. So the idea is that you are checking your code not on an, on an initial state or an arbitrary state. And the way you do it, you essentially compile your code into a mathematical formula and then use solver for the mathematical formula to find bugs. And this is a, a technology which has been around. There are open source tools like Daphne, SMT Checker by the Ethereum Foundation, and CBMC. But the idea is that Sertor Approval is another technology. It checks the bytecode. The difference between that and the academic tool is that it's more scalable. And you can see that it actually runs on much larger code. The, the, the problem of the, form of the automatic formal verification, because the computer is, it is good in the sense that it gives you very high coverage, but because the computer is, is ultimately limit, there is a question of how, how expensive it is. And, and this is what the Sartori team is trying to do, make this technology weak. And the first technology, which also existed, is called proof assistant. So proof assistant is the idea is that not instead of the, the computer, the human is in the loop. So you are writing your proof. As a part of your proof, you are actually extracting the code. So basically, for example, you're not writing your code in Solidity. You are writing your code in K or in Cork or in other technology. And then you can, from it, you can derive provably correct code. People have used it in the past for compilers in the area of of uh, smart contract, there is a company writer verification that, that pursue this. Uh, the, the, the thing of, which is the limit of this technology, that the effort is very high because you have to really, uh, really understand basically the mathematical properties of your code. And from that, you derive the code. Usually the way programmers work is not this way. They program before and then they verify. So this actually requires you to think in a different way than than you, when you normally program. So just to give you an example to motivate you, this is Slitter running on a very, very small contract called Bank. And you see the red lines, it says these are mistakes that the Slitter uh, reported. And you see Slitter reported several bugs. Does anybody want to guess how many of them are real? So there are a few bugs here. Do you want to guess? Um, probably none, I would guess, because Slitter always gives us like a uh, false uh, positives. Exactly, exactly. That's, so that's exactly the problem. None of them are weak. Okay, so just sort of giving you the idea, sort of explaining you this in a, in a more uh, graphical way. You see here, this, the, the idea is that uh, you have on the left hand side, you have these powerful tool, Isabel, Daphne, K, Lee. This is very, very powerful but it's actually very hard to use. On the, on the other hand, you have the thing which is easy to use, but not as powerful. The, and kidna, the meat. And what Sartori is trying to do is build something in the middle and you can judge yourself where we are. So the idea is we want to make it almost as, exp as, as expressive as COC, and we are not nearly there, but COC is a very expressive tool, which is open source. So, but we want to go lean by Microsoft, which is also very powerful. But we want to make it easy to use, almost like like Bitwheel or Kidna. It's not; it's a bit harder, but we want to make it almost as, as easy as, as as this kind of fuzzing tools. And one key idea is that you write the spec in an easy to way, and you will see it uh, 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 based late, later. Alex will show it to you. And also another key idea to scalability is modularity. If your code is modular, this technology will work much better. So what does Sertora do? We have this language called CBL. So it's not a programming language. It's a language to declare the properties. And it's application specific. You declare the logical mistake. And then we have technologies. We have the Sertora Prover. This is a proprietary technology that you can use basically by, by the cloud to check the code. This is automatic formal verification. There is a Gambit. This is open source. It's already available now on GitHub. It's an open source for checking the spec themselves. So the idea is you mutate the code in order to check the, the code is actually available already uh, starting last week. It's available. You can take the GitHub and use it. 
And we are also building foresight. We are building a technology that can run this sort of approval on, a, on, on individual transactions. So this will give you more coverage because we can check certain things and we can check things that we're not wearing something yeah. that is uh, outside. Hey, what the? <laughs> hey? Uh, sorry, I think someone unmuted themselves and uh, sorry, okay. I think we're going no, to go. No way, no way. So, so we are building three technologies. Today I will focus on the first one, but the second one I said it's already available and the third one we are, we are working on, but I will focus on the Satora pool. Okay, so in fact, what I wanna show you and Alex will show you too, I want to show you the CDL. I want you to show you how we write spec. And one of the most interesting thing about formal verification is the idea of invariant. So invariant, these are properties that actually are supposed to hold in your program. It's actually some kind of good properties. For example, the casino is always win, or for in the case of blockchain, that you have solvency, that basically the assets that you owe, that you hold, they exceed the liability. So you're not bankrupt. So these are interesting properties, and it go back to our install or in computer science, there is Dijkstra. This is the idea of writing these kind of properties. And the interesting thing that Sertora builds technology that finds automatically finds violation of these properties. So let's look into solvency. Solvency is the most interesting property. Basically, for example, if everybody wants to the bank, the bank can still fulfill uh, uh, the commitment. So these are examples of protocol that work with Sertora and they work with the Sertora before the code was deployed, but after the audit completed audit. And basically the, the audit was done by the best auditing firm. And you see that these are mistakes that were found by the Sertora approval after the audit was completed. And I think Trident, I'll be able, or I will be able to show you later this kind of part. And you see here the value which could have been lost has this book code been uh, actually released. So how does the Sertora approval work? It takes the invariant on one hand, this is the CVL. It takes the code on the other hand, actually we don't handle the source code, we handle the byte code, but that's a detail. And we either give you a proof, we give you a mathematical proof that all the behaviors of the code are okay, but actually the most interesting case that we give you a violation. It gives you a violation which is potentially very hard to find. And this violation is actually something that says under certain condition, you have some illogical mistake in your code that uh, breaks this kind of invariant. Unfortunately, and this is what I alluded, since this is a mathematically hard problem, the tool is doomed to fail on some input. And what Sertora is trying to do is to make the technology robust enough so there are fewer failures. And that's why we have a lot of people working on that and trying to actually improve the tool and reduce the time up, make the tool easier to use uh, almost like unit test. The other usage of this tool, which is uh, uh, basically is, is, is into your build process. So we integrate into your build process and every time you change your call, you run the tool. And assuming that the environment do not change, you run it again and again and again. Technology is fairly complex. I won't be able to explain, but there's a lot of things that is implemented here. There is a compiler, there is a, uh, its own representation. We have this uh, unique static analysis here, which is actually analyze the bytecode, but in fact, it also uh, checks some invariant. And we have reported several uh, security bugs in the compiler itself that were found, found by our technology when we took the invariant. And we're also doing a lot of things, and this is basically what these people which are experts in this domain are doing, in order to scale the technology so that the mathematical solving the constraint is easier. And this is actually something that we are doing in order to make the tool easier to uh, faster to use. So let's start with a very, very simple example. I'll have more examples. I will appreciate our audience. So this is sort of a, a hello world, the simplest example of a code. You are transferring a balance from one account to another. And the environment that we want to maintain is the total is equal to the sum of the balance. Do you want to guess if this environment holds or not? So this is a very, very simple environment. But even there, it could be broken. Do you want to guess? Somebody here? In the... 
How oh, can you revoke it? Feel free to just unmute and um, just give it a shot. So of course. So you are you are not subtracting the balance from. So I so it will uh, of course. Uh, so in the second last line, so it's never subtracted. Say say it one more time. So I, I, I said that uh, this inv invariant uh, will not hold, so it will fail. Why? Oh, oh, for what input? I mean, you are you are, ah, okay. you are subtracting here and you are adding here. It looks like to me I'm ah, not okay. a, yeah, but, I'm not a uh, programmer, but if I, if you'd ask me before I use the tool, actually, it's, <laughs> I would say it's okay. Intuitively, okay. it looks right. That's the idea. I mean, usually formal methods is good to find some some behavior that sort of surprise and, and and the more the complex is called you can get more surprising behaviors so there so here even though so maybe basically let's run the tool and see what the tool found the tool found actually if l is transferred to it to herself then you see that basically she gained money because the way the code is written it's actually not actually taking care of the fact that if you have the same address and actually even though it's a simple bug people have stole money with this kind of very, very simple bug. Okay, so that's what is found. And if you change the code, for example, here it's a simpler code that you don't actually use this intermediate result. And as a result, it can give you a mathematical proof that the sum of the environment before and after is the same. So the sum of the environment, the sum of the balance did not change. So that's the idea. So, and maybe I can give you a more interesting example, which was not found by us. It was found by our customer. So we have one customer, I'm sure you all know, Maker, one of the top players in this space. So they wrote their own environment and they wrote an environment on the die. So die is a stable coin that they implement. And they wrote the environment that says it's a stable coin. And guess what? They have thought actually they've proved the tool, but actually the, the tool, they have thought that they've improved the environment, but the tool found this bug. And this is a four year old bug. So basically the code was four year old code and actually they find they found a mistake. And if you look into the mistake, it's basically there is the generate case in the init function that this environment here, which the, basically it's a stable code that says that the sum is equal to the sum that you hold. And the, the tool found that there is one behavior that actually allow you to violate. So this is the thing, this is the use of this technology. It's a, like quality assurance before code is deployed to find interesting, hard to find bugs. So maybe I give you uh, sort of a, a, a one interesting bug, which is more tricky, which was found in the Trident. And uh, later on, Alex will demonstrate how the tool finds it. So this is the, the, the Trident implement what is called uh, uh, basically, there's there's a pool with two tokens, and 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 basically it has an operation called ban single, where you can ban one of the tokens. And this actually had a bug. You see, instead of using the, the they actually even not use the correct API. So instead of this code, it should be this. And what happened is the tool find this bug, and it's actually of course the tool doesn't know how to write the code, but it knows the environment and it checks the environment and then it finds the violation. So let's see what happened. And by the way, this is a tricky code. It's about 2000 lines of Solidity code and it's 24 lines of EVM code. For comparison, open source tools, for example, Daphne, they usually handle up to 100 lines of code. So this is actually, you can see here how mature is this technology. And also you notice if you compare to Slater and others, this tool actually has many, many behaviors. So it's very, very hard to find this kind of bug with fuzzing or unit test. So how does the tool work? The tool actually starts in an arbitrary state in which this is the environment that you have, that if one of the token is zero, the other token is, is zero. So they're either both zero or neither zero. And it runs this trident and you see we have Bob and Alice in the game. And basically, Alice does something which looks a bit weird. She burns her holding and gets 200 tokens. And as a result, you see the environment is broken. And you can ask yourself, what's the significance? 
So this is actually was found automatically by our tool. But later on, of course, our engineers look at it and see, and this is of course manual by hand. We look into this bug, we see the violation of the environment, and we try to understand what is the implication and what are the implications of this kind of bug. So the, you see the environment is broken. You see that now token A is 400 and token B is zero. So one of them is zero and the others is not. So what is the implication? The implication and here you see a trace that actually there is a, the following. Basically, there is a, Alice deposit 100 token A and 100 B, Bob deposit 100 A and 100 B, uh, Alice transfer uh, 200. So now there is a lot, a uh, lot, lot of token A, then there's Bell Singer, and finally Alice swap one token for the rest of the token. So Bob is left with no money. So Alice took all Bob's money. And essentially, this is the behavior which was prevented by the Sator approval. It's a behavior that will allow you to completely deplete the sushi code. And this is what we want to do with formal verification. We want to actually uh, uh, avoid these kind of uh, behaviors. So, and how does the tool work? It looks into a single transaction. It looks into a single transaction. We start from an arbitrary state into an arbitrary state. Notice that it's very different than fuzzy that you start with initial state. This is starting in an arbitrary state. And of course, this is powered by mathematics. It's powered by the ability to reason about, about the code in a mathematical way. And I'm not explaining this here, but this is the idea. It runs on this kind of transaction and, it's, it, and it checks this problem. So this is, you go from token A, and you, you, you go from a state which satisfies the environment into a state that in, uh, uh, violates the environment. So basically this transition starts from a state satisfying the environment into a state violating the environment. So I, I wanna actually finish before Alex actually does the uh, demo. I wanna tell you sort of few high level about formal methods. It's actually a mature things in computer science, but we have written a blog trying to explain what's the issues here. Many of them actually is not specific to blockchain, but some are specific to blockchain. So the biggest value of formal verification, and this is known, of course, in the hardware industry. Formal verification is not just for proving bugs. Formal verification is for, bug, for finding bugs. It's not for proving absence of bugs. It's actually for fi bug finding. So basically, when people tell you that they use formal verification, ask them how many bugs they have found. And this is the biggest value of formal verification is this preventing of bugs that we have seen with sushi, with the maker and other. The other question about formal verification, formal verification is a very hard computational problem. We have theorems like Rice theorem in computer science and other theorems uh, that basically say that the computer can never do formal verification. But in fact, it's of course true. These theorems are true, but we think that the hardest problem in, in formal verification is actually coming up with the invariant. And this is where Satora tried to help. The other thing is that formal verification, like any other techniques and other security, like auditing or like, like, like fuzzing, like, like bug bounty, it's never a bulletproof. You always have, want to do everything. And formal verification is a tool for drastically improve uh, correctness. And we are seeing with our customers that work with formal verification that in fact, it does improve the code correctness and it's improved the code security, but it's never bulletproof. Another thing, since in, for, in the area of, of uh, smart contract and DeFi, there is a standard of using auditing. Some people think that by the, they can avoid auditing by using formal verification. That's not the case. These are two complementary things that work very well together. We work with auditors usually before auditing, but we can also work after auditing. And the auditor, if they work after us, they can review our specification because one way that we will miss bugs if we will not have the right. <coughs> and maybe the last thing about formal verification is formal verification. Some people want to delay it as, as much as possible because they see it as an expensive procedure, both in terms of human and, and the machines. So they say, let's make the code more stable before we do formal verification. With our experience, this is usually a mistake. You want to shift security left. You want to actually start formal verification as early as you can, because first of all, it's easier. You will find more bugs, and also you'll make the code more amenable to formal verification, because the, the idea is that 
when you, if you work with it, especially if you work with, with our tool, but either if you work with other, if, with other tools, it doesn't matter. You are starting, you write this invariant, even when the code is not feature complete. And of course, even if you're not using our tool, you write a victim of invariant early is a very, very good thing. Before you even start, when you write your white paper and you write everything, you are you have to uh, basically write use use this kind of tool and you can write in Uh To conclude, bug finding is very very hard. Uh, in the area of smart contract, we have smart contract. They are event driven, and fuzzing is a good technique, but it doesn't find uh, a, many of the errors. Static analysis in SMT, which we what we implement, is works better together. I haven't explained to you the technology, but the idea is that the static analysis actually is reduced the SMT complexity, and the SMT, the mathematical solving, it is introduced the false positive and false negative that you get from two from Slater. So the idea is we are combining two techniques together, and in particular we implemented this automatic formal verification that you will see, uh, soon see in action. It starts in arbitrary state and not in, in initial state. It finds tri tricky bugs, and it can also prove high-level property like solvency. And also, we do not restrict your programming style. So you can write your program the way you want. You can write it imperative. You can write it functional. We can write it object-oriented. We let you program the way you are. So I don't know what the organizers suggest. Maybe we. We, so do you want to go to the demo before the Q&A or, or what, what would be better? Um, I think uh, generally we are very used to having the Q&A after everything. So I think we can move on to the demo and afterwards uh, we, we can go to questions because I personally got a few questions already. Great. So Alex, take it from here. All right. Thank you, Muli and uh, Alex, go for it. All right. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about, I hope uh, I'm audible. Uh, yes, uh, we can hear you. Yes. All right. Uh, I'll uh, speak a little bit more about the bug that we found in the Trident uh, liquidity pool platform uh, that Moli also touched upon a little bit. Uh, let's share my screen. Um, yeah, so I hope you can see the, see the code here. Uh, uh, the 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 contract that we are trying to verify here it's a it's a very simple classic two token constant product liquidity pool. Um, for those of uh, you who aren't familiar with liquidity pools, it's pretty central to the way automated market makers work. Uh, and uh, whenever you swap uh, in a dex, when you swap from one token to another, there's a liquidity pool in the background that contains both those tokens, and uh, you exchange one uh, for the other. So this uh, contract that we are looking at here is uh, one uh, such contract. Uh, it has two tokens that it uh, maintains in the pool. It maintains the reserves for the two tokens and uh, it keeps a track of the constant product which will be used uh, when you are trying to swap from one token to the other in order to determine how much quantity of uh, a token will you get in return for a certain quantity of another token. Uh, this token, I mean, this contract also implements ERC20 functionality uh, because every time you add liquidity to this pool, it will mint a certain amount of LP tokens and give you those LP tokens uh, as a proof of uh, you having supplied liquidity to the pool. Uh, so as a liquidity provider, you can withdraw your liquidity by uh, burning these LP tokens that were given to you in the first place when you supplied liquidity. Uh, so that's a very high level view of what uh, liquidity pools uh, do and what this contract is trying to do. And uh, before we delve into the spec or the code, uh, I want to uh, get you to think about security properties uh, from the point of view of a liquidity provider. Uh, as a liquidity provider, when I provide liquidity to a pool, I, sh uh, I should be very sure that uh, in exchange for the liquidity that I've provided, I should be able to get some proof, which is to say that I should be able to get, I should get liquidity pool tokens, LP tokens, which is like a proof that I have provided liquidity. And I should always have the ability to exchange those LP tokens back for the for my share of the, the underlying uh, 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 liquidity uh, pool tokens. Uh, so that very high level property, when we think of that uh, without diving into the exact implementation of the contract, uh, we can, uh, you know, transcribe that uh, 
that uh, property that just we, uh, we just spoke of into a very simple logical expression that uh, basically says that if there's any outstanding supply of uh, uh, liquidity pool tokens, then uh, there should be some reserves to back those tokens. It should never be the case that there are LP tokens in circulation, but there are no reserves to back them. Uh, and it goes the other way around as well. That if there are reserves in the in the in the liquidity pool, then there should be LP tokens uh, corresponding to those reserves. Because if that's violated, then that would mean that there is still liquidity in the pool, but there are no LP tokens to claim that liquidity. Which means that some uh, liquidity provider did not uh, get uh, LP tokens in exchange for the uh, liquidity that they provided to the pool. Uh, so this very simple intuitive property is uh, is an invariant in the system, uh, and uh, this is what an invariant looks like in uh, in the Satora prover world, where uh, you just state the expression that you want to always hold uh, in a code, and uh, that's that. And uh, so uh, we should first, uh, without looking at the contract, let's first uh, run this spec and uh, see what happens. The way we run the spec is uh, uh, through a script where we call the call the tool, we uh, give it the solidity file, specify the contract we want to verify in the file. Uh, we also provide the spec that we want to verify the code against. Uh, and uh, then we run the uh, we, we, we run the verification. Uh, the two things are compiled uh, and uploaded to the cloud where uh, the processing happens. Uh, I will show you what the run looks like uh, without waiting. So th this typically takes around a minute to go through um, without uh, keeping you guys on hold. I'll just show you what a run looks like. On the left side, this is what a typical report uh, looks like for the verification. On the left side, you have uh, this pane where you'll have a list of all the rules that you've run. And uh, those rules will have a green circle with a check mark in it or a red circle with a cross in it that says violated, which shows you uh, if there's an issue. In this case, we see that it's being violated. The, the invariant that we just wrote is being violated. And uh, when we uh, dive deeper, we see that it's uh, being violated uh, in the preserved state. So I I'd like to talk a little bit more about uh, how invariants work uh, in solidity in uh, Sertora. Invariants are uh, first uh, contract is in the constructors, and then the we'll text whether the contract at that point uh, the state contract is it uh, the it's uh, uh, the invariant. Uh, I hope I, my, think, uh, I, I, I just my... got a message saying my. Uh, yeah, your your your, uh, your, it, your your internet was not so good. Maybe you can repeat. Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, what is the last thing you heard, Muru? Invariant. You said, and then maybe you start from the beginning. I think at least I lost it. Right. All right. Uh, so invariants are checked in two stages. The first, we uh, first a code uh, the contract is deployed and the constructor is run, and then the tool checks whether at this point the state of the contract agrees with the invariant. Uh, and the next thing to do is that the tool assumes an arbitrary state, which still uh, agrees with the invariant. And then the tool calls uh, a function in the contract, and then again checks after the function execution as to whether the state of the contract still um, adheres to the invariant. Uh, using these two steps, we can by induction prove that uh, the contract uh, if it uh, passes in both these steps, then by induction, we can say that uh, the contract will always uh, uh, adhere to the invariant. And uh, if in any of these states, uh, it violates the invariant, it means that it's possible to uh, to break this invariant. In this case, uh, I hope I'm still, uh, uh, you can still see my screen, hear me clearly. Yes, we can see the Sator.com uh, website. All right, all right. So in this case, when we uh, when we click on the invariant, we see that it's uh, falling, it's failing in the preserved state, which is the second stage uh, after the, the construction has happened, and you you assumed an arbitrary starting state, which agrees with the invariant, and then you call the function, and then check again uh, whether the invariant still holds. If this is that state, we click further, and it shows us a list of uh, functions that were called, and in this list, we sh we see that there's a function called burn single. 
which is failing. Uh, now let's go back to the code and I'll uh, tell you a little bit more about what the code is doing. So as I said, it is a, it's a classic two token liquidity pool where you can supply liquidity in exchange of that liquidity, you get LP tokens, which you can again burn at any point and get your liquidity back. So the way you get your liquidity back is by burning your LP tokens. Typically, the way it works in a liquidity pool is that uh, when you burn your liquidity pool tokens uh, in exchange for it, the contract will give you a certain number of uh, each of the two tokens in the pool. Uh, and that's basically your share of uh, the liquidity pool at that time. Uh, but in this contract, there is a there is a function of special interest to us, which, which is called burn single. This uh, takes that burn functionality to uh, a little bit further where it allows you the uh, convenience of withdrawing your liquidity in not two separate tokens, but one single token. So it uh, saves you the, uh, the hassle of then uh, swapping from one token into another after you've withdrawn your liquidity. So the way this function works is that uh, as, uh, as parameters, it takes uh, three parameters. One is uh, uh, the token that you want to withdraw your liquidity in, Second is the, the liquidity uh, that you want to burn, which is the, basically the number of LP tokens you want to burn at this point. The third is the address of the recipient uh, who is supposed to get the liquidity, which is which will be withdrawn. Uh, so what it does is that it uh, first fetches the current reserves and the balances of the contract for both the tokens, and then it calculates your share of uh, the, the liquidity pool, which is supposed to be paid out to you now. The way it does that, th does that is that it looks at the total liquidity that liquidity that you are burning, uh, calculates a fraction of that uh, with the total supply of liquidity pool tokens out there uh, to get to, send, to to understand how much uh, of uh, what share of the LP to, uh, the liquidity pool you own and multiplies that with the balances respective balances of the two tokens to calculate the amount uh, of each token that is owed to you. At this point, it will burn the liquidity that you've supplied, and then it will proceed to convert one of these tokens into the other, uh, depending on what token you've uh, opted for uh, to cash out in. And uh, to do that, it calls a function. So, so it basically needs to now convert one of these amounts into uh, some amount of another token, for which uh, it can, it calls a function called uh, get amount out. Uh, if we look at this function, uh, we see that uh, this function receives three things. It receives the number of tokens that need that the user wants to trade out of, and it and it receives the current state of the uh, the liquidity pool, which is the uh, the reserve amounts for each of the token after the withdrawal has happened, uh, and uh, it calculates the amount as such here. And uh, now let's go back to the call trace and see what's happening here. So, so when you click on uh, the the violating function here, uh, the tool will show you a call trace here, which is showing you a detailed uh, a flow of the execution that the uh, that the tool went through uh, when it found this uh, this counter example that violates the invariant. So we see that the assertion which is checking the invariant, this assertion has failed, and we see that the reserves uh, have gone down to zero for token zero in this case. So, uh, so clearly there are uh, there's a total supply still there for uh, token uh, zero, but it turns out the reserves have gone down to zero. So let's find out how that happened. This since this happened in the preserve state, it happened when some function was called, and we know that that function was the burn single function, and uh, we see that the burn single function was called with these uh, these parameters where we specified that the token is. Uh, uh, 2714. You can see that the two tokens that we are working with, uh, that the tool is working with here are 2714 and 2710. Uh, uh, I should also tell you that the, the uh, typical report has three different panes. The one on the left shows you a list of uh, rules, uh, which you can uh, uh, dive a little bit deeper into to see exactly which functions are failing the rule or the invariant that you're trying to, take, uh, trying to test. Uh, the central pane will show you a detailed call trace, and the pane on the right will show you uh, values of the variables that the tool is working with, and it will also show you any call resolutions uh, with respect to calls that happen to external contracts. Uh, so yeah, so we see that the two tokens that uh, are in the liquidity pool are 2714, 2710, and uh, the 
I, I'll take you back to the code so we can follow along uh, easily. Um, so so when the, when the get amount out function is called, we see that uh, oh sorry, I'm checking the wrong place. Yeah, so we've uh, we've uh, pulled, uh, we've checked what the current reserves are, what the current balances are, and the tool that shows us that the the random state that it it had started from. Uh, in that state, the reserves for the two tokens are five and seven, and the balances are five and thirteen, and the total supply of the LP tokens is uh, seven four four, uh, and the liquidity that the current uh, user, the liquidity provider who's trying to withdraw liquidity. Uh, the liquidity held by that user is 3 uh, EB uh, as opposed to a total supply of 744. Now, when uh, the get amount out function is called, uh, we are saying that uh, the amount that we want to swap out of uh, is uh, seven tokens of uh, token two, which is 2710, and uh, the current state of the reserves of the two contracts. And this is where we first see a problem. We see that the current state of the con uh, of the pool, which is after the uh, the liquidity has been pulled out, uh, it turns out that one of the reserves has gone down to zero. And uh, when you look at the execution, when you look at the calculation that happens in the get amount out function, you see that if the reserve amount in uh, parameter, this is supplied uh, as zero, then the output is basically the reserve amount, the entire reserve amount of the token that you you want to pull liquidity out of. And that's exactly what's happening here. Uh, the liquidity uh, amount returned here, uh, which is three. This this and the the amount that was calculated for uh, withdrawal for this token, which is token one, uh, which was two, uh, which we'll see later. Uh, three and two together is five, and that is what is being transferred out to this user in the next step where we see the transfer function being called. The transfer function is being called, and we are saying that the total amount we pulled out is this, which is the entire reserve for token uh, token zero. So at this point, uh, uh, so the tool is basically telling us that it's possible to get into a state where uh, you can draw the entire liquidity out. In theory, if the person who's withdrawing the liquidity has to pull out the entire reserves for a token, then that person should basically have all the LP tokens in circulation. That person should have, should be holding 100% uh, shares of the liquidity pool. But uh, in the call trace, we can clearly see that the total uh, liquid, the total supply is... Uh, uh, well, so total supply is 744 and uh, LP tokens held by the user was clearly smaller than that. So how did it happen that a user with a smaller, with a share less than 100% is able to withdraw the entire uh, uh, reserves, underlying reserves for a token? It happened because uh, the, sh the amounts that are being calculated here are being calculated on the balances. And the tool shows us that the state that it started in, the balance uh, is not necessarily the same as the reserves. In fact, the balance for one of the tokens is uh, significantly higher than the reserves that the contract is tracking. And uh, so what's happening is that your smaller share of the liquidity pool uh, is being uh, multiplied by an inflated number, which is the balance here, which is giving you an amount which happens to be equal to the total reserves of uh, that token. And so uh, when, you cal when you call the get amount out function, uh, the reserves, the updated reserves uh, that you are specifying to this function happens to be zero for token zero because you've uh, basically subtracted seven from seven. You've calculated an uh, inflated value that is owed to you and that is being subtracted from the reserves. And uh, that zero value then leads to the calculation that allows you to drain the pool of the entire liquidity available for token zero. Uh, so, so the tool told us that it's possible to take this invariant. And uh, if we think further, we can take this attack even further, where now that the reserves for token zero is zero, 
we can uh, call this contract, uh, we can call the burn single function again with uh, one token for our token zero. And uh, this time, since the reserves are zero for token zero, the calculation will, uh, the get amount out function will allow us to withdraw the entire liquidity for the other token. So uh, in the end, what happens is that by supplying one, uh, by if, if you can manipulate the balance of uh, the contract in such a way that your share of the LP tokens can give you the entire liquidity for one token, you can then proceed to call the burn single function again with just one uh, amount of uh, uh, amount equal to one for token zero and then withdraw whatever uh, liquidity is remaining for the other token as well. Uh, and the, the tool showed us that this is possible. And the way you can actually do this is by, uh, by uh, you know, getting a flash loan, sending that money over to this contract and in the process, inflating the balance of the contract uh, while the reserves uh, continue to stay uh, as they were earlier. And uh, this is, and when you send the, the money over from the flash loan, you don't call any function that that updates the reserves and makes them equal to the balance. And so when the burn single function is called, the, for the contract will calculate the amounts owed to you on an inflated balance and give you this uh, attack vector. So that's uh, that's how we found this uh, uh, potentially very serious bug uh, in the Trident platform. Any questions? Um, not so, not not uh, not for now. But um, yeah, we do have. Uh, I do have some further questions. But uh, if you have uh something, I mean, if you have more things to go, you can go for go for it. Right. I think yeah. good to have actually present because it's ten minutes, Alex. Maybe we should have people with questions. Probably there's only ten minutes left. Sure. There's all okay. the material on the web. Okay. Um. Just let me. So um. Thank you, uh, Muli and uh, Alex. Um. We would normally um do like a quick fireside chat to get to know you guys first, and then we will proceed with a, some Q and A. Uh, and I think there will there are quite, a, quite there will be a few questions. Uh, actually, quite a lot actually for me. So um before we start um so um so I understand that uh, blockchain is a really new space, a really relatively new space compared to should be com compared to form uh, formal verification techniques. Uh, so what made uh you guys um jump into the world of blockchains and uh what do you think is why do you think it's a good idea to form a, formally uh, formally verify uh solidity code and what are the probably difficulties when it comes to uh start what is the what's the difference when it comes to uh, formally verifying a smart contract and a normal uh, program great great question so the so just to repeat the question the question is why are we doing it in a in a in a smart contract so first of all i've actually use formal verification on many other domains, avionics software, uh, other things, uh, basically data structure, operating system. I think for uh, formally verifying smart contract and DeFi is very interesting because A, the code has a lot of value. So this small code has a lot of value. So mistakes have a significant impact. B, the code is fairly, even though it's, simple, it's small, it's actually fairly complex. Even the code that you're seeing by Alex it has many behaviors, so it's hard for human to see that it's correct. Three is, but basically, once the code is deployed, it's hard to modify. It, okay, and and maybe the most interesting reason, if you look into safety critical code, it's actually not changed a lot. But in the area of crypto, basically, people actually you see sushi, sushi has version one, version two. So the business dictates of smart contract are being updated. So let's make it in some sense an ideal domain for formal verification because you have this small code or modular code which carry very high value and this code is being updated all the time. So I think it's it's a very it's sort of a killer application of this technology. And this is actually what motivates me to take ideas which have been developed by academic colleagues and actually making them into industrial tool and try to make this tool as easy as, as possible. Thank you. Thank you for the explanation. Uh, in some sense, this is, you can think about it like uh, smart contract is almost like hardware. I mean, hardware is very interesting to verify because once you have a bug in chip, there was a bug in the Intel chip, and that has a huge cost. 
So smart contract is almost like, 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 like hardware in a sense that once this code is deployed, it's really, really hard to change it, especially if it carries values. So that's why you really want to invest any effort and, and, and formal method is one of them to basically make sure that your code is correct before the code is deployed. Cool. So uh, we have we have talked about uh, the, the the awesomeness of uh, formal verifications and what it can do, like find bugs. What do you think? For example, uh, I'm pretty sure, uh, like as a a lot of smart contract developers fall in the trap that oh my contract is audited, so it should be bug free. And uh, I'm pretty sure there will be people who thinks along the line oh my my contract is formal verified, so it should bug free. What do you what what do you what do you have? Um, do you have like a word of two for this kind uh, these people who have uh, this this thing this kind of thinking? Yes, yes. I think one uh, some level of paranoia is very, very good. When the tool finds a bug, it's very good. But when the tool doesn't find a bug, the biggest mistake would be that the invite itself is not like, and you are making certain assumptions. So I think the formal verification, if you're not using right, it's not a good thing. And if, even if you're using it right, you you, you all, always have to check things like maybe price manipulation. You always have to check some properties. And I think the, you should think of formal verification as one of your tools in Arsenal to make your code more secure, but it's it's never 100% secure. And I think you have to have bug bounties. You have to have everything to, to make sure your code is, is, is correct. Cool. Thanks so much for the, for the advice. Um, a, a bit of a cheeky question from my side. Uh, have, because formal verification helped find bugs, so have any um, hackers, uh, white hat or black hat, users uh, probably your tool to find bugs in existing contracts and exploit it. Uh, have you have any experience, or maybe you guys have found like a bug in a in a, in a contract that has a very high TVL, and you guys try to exploit it? So has there been any uh, incident or any any thoughts uh, of doing that? Yes, yes. So this is definitely a big risk. We try to monitor our tool, and this is a big risk ourselves. When we found a bug in a, in contact with high TVL. We didn't. Uh, we basically contacted the the team. We are we have responsible bug disclosure. We actually contact the team and and waited for them to fix the the code. And yeah, so the so the the and also we nowadays there are, there are bug bounty program like Immunify. But yes, this is a definitely risk of this kind of using this technology. Our technology is cloud based, so basically in principle we can monitor and somebody can monitor it, and also. It's the technology which is available to everybody. So hopefully the, the owner of the protocol can check it uh, check it too. But yes, you are right. If it's a, it's a tool which is a risky in the sense that it can find these rare behaviors and actually use them to, to, to uh, find bugs. We have few customers who have been using our, the demo tool without paying us, but I, I hope they're not. Sounds like so far they're using it on their own code, which is fine. But you are, you are, we are also aware that somebody uses not only the code that, that they own, and maybe we need to make our technology more advanced that somehow at the moment you, you don't even need that access to the source. You can run on the bike. But maybe you are saying that in the future, we want to make this technology that you make sure that you only run on the code that you own. And, and, but that's not at the moment what is checked. But it's definitely, it's, it is a risk. It is a risk of, uh, if you if you uh, find a property with this tool, you and you don't disclose it, it's it's a risk. Yeah, uh, I I always use the analogy like a knife can be used to maybe um like help you in cooking and also can use be used to inject others. So it depends on how you use the tool. I guess that's the same analogy. Exactly. So we have another question by Hafiz. Uh, he's interested in using formal verification in a small school project. So uh, he's interested in know like. What are the prices and uh, any education plans for university and so on and so forth? So we have an interested user here. Yes. So the the pricing is zero. <laughs> we we will. I mean, we charge pricing for SaaS customer. But if you're not developing a DeFi, you can approach us and we can. Uh, in terms of education, there is actually this is how we got Alex to work with us. There is Sequel, which is a, a free uh, bootstrap. We also can do, and, and actually there, there was one that we did last year. There's another one which we we'll do next year. I think Alex, do you remember maybe March? I think there's one coming now. I don't remember. Alex, do you know when it's planned? I don't know. Yeah, I think it's uh, 9th March, starting 9th March. Going yeah. 22nd. 
Yeah, and there is also Macro. This is a, a, a US-based team which is doing uh, uh, courses for for which are uh, basically for profit. We are also interested in uh, and and we uh, we are interested in uh, in uh, in uh, uh, we we are interested in in uh, doing courses with universities. There's also you probably seen there's Code Arena. So basically, there is a, a competition for writing rules, and it's starting in a few days, actually, uh, next week. So please join it, and you can get uh, start writing rules, and you can get bounties or writing rules for the customer. And uh, and uh, and uh, there's no fee. You get actually money for participating. You get money in this case not from us, from the customer for which you write the rules. So you get uh, money from the customer. You get the reward. For writing rules for the customer, it's uh, announced announced in Code Arena or also Setora. Thank you. Everything... Thank you. I heard you mentioned Macro. Is that Xerox Macro, the uh, auditing company? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Interesting because I graduated from one of the cohorts and I'm currently going to, uh, in partnership with them, uh, I will I will let you know. <laughs> I'll shout out to Macro. Okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> so that's good. And we and if you guys are in university. And we'd like to hold your own course. I'm always happy to help. I think we have other people on the team, uh, Thomas Adams, uh, Michael George, who, who, are, who will be willing to give uh, material and help you with the teaching. So please uh, help us. We want to, yes, uh, and, and yeah, it's easy to get access to the tool. And if you want to teach this, I think we always get better with the, with the teaching. Lovely. Uh, yeah, uh, for sure. I would, I would personally would like to see like a workshop on formal verification. So that's very cool. Uh, a bit more of a technical question. Uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, do you have like a bit more time for, for, for a couple of questions? Uh, we, I, we have as much as time as needed. Lovely. Thank you so much. So a bit quest, a, a bit of a tech, more technical question. So is Satora approval only uh, applicable for solid code? Uh, are you also able to formally verify um, non-EVM languages such as SUI? Or even EVM languages such as Viper or Fee, or maybe Cairo, uh, and um, some of the more up upcoming uh, smart contract languages out there. Yes. So the answer is that uh, Satora approve actually work on internal representation, which is called TAP, three others code, and and this is actually more general than EVM. But we do have some limits. At the moment, we are targeting mainly the uh, the. Uh, uh, the, the EVM base. So we have version for Solidity. There is version for Viper, which is coming. There is a version which eBPF, and eBPF is for Solana, and this is handling Rust, and later it will handle Move. So the idea is that we want to handle as many languages as possible. We are not handling Cairo at the moment, but that's definitely interesting for us because of the reasoning about finite fields, but it's not something we can do at the moment, but it's definitely if we spend enough uh, R and D, we are looking to understand where do people write contracts. And usually, for us, there is an R and D cost of developing the new tool. So we are we are gonna actually at the moment the, on our roadmap for 2023, we have a version coming for Viper very soon, and a version which coming for Rust and Solana uh, also very soon. I think Move is also definitely on our roadmap. Interesting. So we have a question from Ifrin. I hope I get your name correctly. So he says, if I'm planning to use Satora for professional bug hunting, uh, will, will I be incurred any costs? Yes. So the, the hope is that the answer is no. The, the answer is that we we are really want to make this basically, this is a tool for developers. At the moment, for, for now, when we have people who are engaged with us on a private basis, we are not uh, charging anything. Having said that, we want to make sure that the tool works. So, so, uh, but I think yes, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it, it, yes. Cool. Um, another technical question. So, uh, at which level does uh, the Satora approval operates? Do you operate at a bytecode, EVM bytecode level, or like in the U level? So, uh, how how exactly does uh, Satora analyzes the code? It works on the bytecode level. It works on the bytecode level. It works on the bytecode level. It first run the compiler and get the bytecode level, and then it runs to something which we call decompiler because it goes from the bytecode level into much higher level representation because actually the bytecode level is a stack machine and we bound the, the machine. So 
we do a lot of techniques to make the analysis easier and we probably will do more. And we have static analysis that simplifies the code. For example, recover variable, recover types, recover information from the source and sometimes even more easier for formal verification. Thank you. Uh, so uh, another another question. So recently uh, in the L2 space, we have seen a lot of um, em emergence of ZK EVM. And uh, I, we know that there are a few types of ZK EVM such as scroll uses like a direct bytecode and uh, Hermes, Polygon Hermes uses like a like some micro opcodes representation. So um, there have been worried uh, worries that um, because of this not direct mapping, uh, it will be a, a security risk for um, developing on probably one of the ZKVMs. So what are your stance and what do you think like Satora can uh, come into, into play? So that's, so you're talking about problems in layer two. Exactly. So problems in layer two are very interesting. We have a customer like uh, Maker who's actually uh, working with our tool to secure layer two. We are interested to secure layer two, maybe showing some kind of equivalence between the one code and the other code. We actually are, Using the tool, the tool we, we haven't seen on you a demo, but the tool actually can take two pieces of code and check if they are equivalent under, uh, under certain restriction. So we can, for example, check code with inline assembly and without inline assembly and see that they behave the same. And I think uh, checking correctness of L2 is very, very interesting for us. Uh, we want to basically do that, but usually the way we work, we work with clients and the and, uh, and, uh, and if uh, our clients want to do that, we, we will help them. Usually we, we engage with certain clients and yes, L2 is very interesting for our client and, and for us. Cool, thank you. A bit of a quick question for those who are wanting to learn formal verification. Uh, what are your tips and advice? Or is it even possible for probably people like me who have no official um, formal verification education in university to pick up formal verification, at least the basics? I, the answer is definitely yes. We see some of our customers that actually come without any background in formal verification. I think Alex also, Alex, you did you have formal verification in uh, school, Alex? I don't even have a computer science background. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> yes, <laughs> and Alex is doing fantastic. So I think that, that I think it's sort of, uh, it's very interesting to, to know what, who, what make your formal verification uh, nerd. I know, uh, I talked to a guy named Bo in Crypto. I don't know if you know him. He's like one of the founder of Crypto of Sushi. And he said, look, I, I saw formal verification. I got it in five minutes. I don't know. It's, it's a, I, I mean, I'm working this domain for a long time. It's either you get it or you, I think it's a hate, hate uh, love thing. I mean, either you hate it or you like it. And I don't know when, when is it? For example, if you like functional programming, I guess maybe formal verification would be interesting, but I don't know if it's, a necessary one. And you don't need to have a formal verification background. And our tool you saw with Alex, uh, Alex talk, it's actually, it doesn't look like a mass. It almost looks like a unit testing. You're writing some rules. I mean, it's not exactly like unit testing. It's definitely more effort. I don't wanna uh, 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 tell you, it's more effort than unit testing, but it's, it almost feels like unit testing with some additional thing. So you start with the unit testing, you, you start like a tool like Foundry, which are very good, and you write the spec in Solidity. And there, from there, you maybe start writing something more with the CVL and understand where you can write more properties. Cool, lovely. So uh, for those who are wanting to pick up, uh, do not do not give up hope. There's always a chance to, for, for you to pick up and uh, probably work professionally uh, like Alex. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you can, if you are, for example, we have this other grant now that we are giving for, people who are helping us secure Aave. So the idea is that it's actually, and, it, and I think if you look into the auditing space, auditing is tricky too. I think with formal verification and auditing together can be very interesting. So basically the idea to read the code and also write these properties. Yep, I've been thinking of the, you, you doing the same as well, writing invariant as well as looking on my own and then try to see if there's anything I miss out. That's, it seems really cool. Um, there's, sorry, there's, there's another question uh, by Hafiz, very interesting one. So can Satora formally verify other codes like Python, Arduino? Uh, it's like a same like spin model checker or TLT, et cetera. Uh, some of the terms I'm not familiar with. Yeah, yeah. So, so these are, this is very interesting tool. The spin model checker is an explicit state model checker. 
So explicit state model checker is a kind of very, very exhaustive testing. So Torah is kind of the opposite. We never work on the concrete level. We work at the formula level. This is uh, giving us some headache, for example, if you have a nonlinear arithmetic. But on the other hand, we had an infinite state. So in the case, even that you see the example that Alex showed you, there's a, a U in 256. If you try to enumerate it with spin, you need two bits. Here is two, 256 bits. So the idea is we don't explicitly enumerate all states. We are handling infinite states. And this is based on the fact that we convert to SMT formulas. The downside is if your code complex, contains uh, complex mass, it could be harder. So we are kind of, it's, it's, it's essentially the opposite to spin in the sense that spin is explicit state model checking. And we are doing what basically are uh, a implicit state of formula. It's not actually representing the, so it's not like testing what we are doing. It's, it's something much more magic. It's this mathematical constraint. And it's a very, very different, but right? I'm getting here very technical. And I think if you are familiar with the uh, open source tools like Daphne or, or, or Viper from, uh, from, uh, from uh, ETH Zurich, it's similar to us. So this is the, so that's a very different than, than speed if you ask. But speed is definitely interesting, especially if, but in the blockchain, it's a bit hard because you have a lot of big numbers and big things. So enumeration, and also it's event driven. So enumeration is very, very hard. Cool, thank you. Uh, if if uh, I, pro I do, I do, I'm, not, I'm not an expert in this field. So if you feel that I, I'm not asking your question properly, do uh, unmute and ask uh, your, for yourself because I believe that uh, you're able to explain better than I do. Another question by Ephraim. It's a tutorial on Satora GitHub. Uh, is, it, is there a Satora uh, tutorial on Satora GitHub? Is it possible for to follow those ex exercises using like a demo license? I, I think so. I think Uwe is on the call. Yes. He... Yes, it's possible. Just use the free demo license. You don't have to install anything besides the tool itself. Super cool. Uh, and uh, Wen Kang has a question. Can you elaborate a bit regarding the relationship between CVL specification language and the SMT checker? Yes. So CVL is the higher level language. It looks like solidity, but it isn't. That's what Alex uh, demonstrated. An SMT checker is something very, very different. This is not developed by Sertora. SMT is a common library for writing mathematical constraints. Uh, this has been around now for three decades, and there are a lot of tools. Uh, they're all open source, Yikes, CVC5, uh, uh, Z3 by Microsoft Research, and Sertora uses them all and also contribute to them. So these are tools that are, they are very powerful. They, are, they have usage, not just in, in, uh, in Sertora. People are using them in, in other domains. It's the, the, these, solver, these solvers have been used in many other domains in computer science. So these are very different. The CVL is a, is a language developed by Sertora, and SMT is, a, is, a, is basically a standard developed by the community, years of academic effort, and there are these, sol these solvers, they all uh, support the same solver. There's also SMT competition every year where they are trying to get better. Actually, Satora contribute benchmarks, so the smart contract benchmark are part of the competition now. So basically, we contribute benchmark in order to improve. We also give grants to these SMT companies in order to improve the, the SMT solving, solvers. Cool. Thank you. Uh, wow. That's uh, Thank you, Muli, and thank you, Alex. I, I'm, I learned a lot today. Uh, and I believe we are out of questions. Um, I'm taking five, uh, four, three, two, one. Any questions? Last call. I see Jafar asked the question. Oh, 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 yeah. Sorry. Um, so sorry. Thank, thank you, Uri. I, I totally missed that. Uh, the question was, um, do you have any graphical representation to see the whole process? And he mentioned that uh, the process means graphical draw automata shapes uh, on the basis of how verification process is done. So probably you want like a graphic, a graphical uh, representation of how the verification is done. So, it's so I think, I think the, there is a there is a graphical representation. I think basically Alex showed the trace of the bug, but you want something to show the think about the proof. I think that we did thought about somehow to see something like uh, basically which passes were explored. So that's as far as we were thinking is we 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 are thinking that sort of. To explore which passes to were explored by the proof. I think it's coming. I don't know. We or Alex, do you know? But I don't know if it's something that is available now. Is there some way uh, when the yeah. 
but the tools say that it is verified. Can you see something, Rui? No, currently not. We do have um, in our backend some sort of a, of a call graph of the program, but it's currently not not yet uh, exposed outside. Uh, it's also very technical. We found out it doesn't really uh, help most people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the issue is that why do you want it? I mean, do you want it to understand? Because the code that we analyze, even the case that Alex showed you, is like 20,000 lines. It would be the, the graphical representation. I don't know how clear it would be in a, on a large program. If you have, usually we, we used to have this kind of academic example, you have five line programs and you do that. But these are very, very uh, complicated programs. I don't know. If you have a bug to demonstrate the bug, that's very interesting. But to demonstrate the proof, maybe one thing you can do with, uh, with SMT, you can have this idea called core unsat. Maybe that could be useful. And, we are using it for coverage. The idea is that when the SAT solver say unsat, you can ask it to give the basic example for the unsat because maybe you have proven a property that because it's not interesting. Cool. Uh, um, Usman Jaffa, if uh, feel free to unmute yourself to ask questions uh, in case you you need more clarification or in case I'm doing a little bad job in exp uh, in asking on your behalf. Um, another question uh, by Wen Kang. So um, is there a situation whereby it is not suitable or not possible to be uh, for code to be verified by formal verification and uh, what are the limits to it? Definitely, definitely. There are many, many limits to formal verification and there are limits to our tool. The limits to our tool is engineering. If you have code which is too complex, we keep improving it, but at the end of the day, it's a very hard mathematical problem. So it's doomed to fail in certain cases. There are also things that, at the moment, the CVS doesn't support, for example, properties like liveness. Usually what we talk about in Sertor is the properties which call safety, in the sense it says that something bad will not happen. And maybe something you want to prove is that something good will happen. And this is something that you can do with the Sertor, but you have to tweak the CVL. It's not, it's not natural. So there are some things that you cannot do at the CVL level, and there are some things that you can write in the CVL and still the tool fails, definitely. And all of this must exist. There are limits to this technology. And it's always the case that we usually try to make the tool good enough for our clients, but it's a, it's, it's, it's a constant battle. Cool. Uh, another question by Wen Kang. Uh, is it possible to auto-generate CVR on a given code based on some assumptions, perhaps some simple constraint and invariant that can be inferred from the code itself? That's something that we are working on. Because part of the problem that we are seeing is that customers that don't work with us and don't uh, use our professional service, it's hard for them to write the spec. So uh, we are definitely thinking of writing some kind of a security booster that will give you a, a rules. Maybe it's not the rules which is generated by the best team that work a lot of time, but at least it will give you some kind of common rules to start. We can also start by go taking rules from foundry. Yes, yeah, so giving some kind of a starting, uh, I mean, if you look into the way that you have in the CBL, I think you have seen it in Alex's example, there's some code which is boilerplate. It's just code which is not needed any thinking. And then there's some other things which need thinking. And maybe we can do something like, for example, talk about something like reentrancy, talk about some kind of uh, common mistake that people are trying to avoid and use the CBL or some kind of reverting condition, try to use the CBL to, to prevent common mistakes. That's definitely a useful uh, uh, direction in the product roadmap of Soto. Cool, thank, thank you so much. Uh, wow, uh, he, he's very impressed by the answer. And uh, speaking of re-entry, I do have a question of my own. Uh, Re-entry in a contract, probably uh, it's not difficult to detect by a formal vacation tool, but what about re-entry among uh, cross contracts? So uh, will, uh, is Sotora able to find bugs when it comes to a cross-contract re-entrancy? I, I will defer to Alex, probably. Or, or Alex, uh, the question is, can we find a, a re-entrancy bug across multiple contracts? I imagine the answer is yes, but I, Yes, so if you're referring to, uh, by multiple contracts, if you're referring to a re-entrancy coming from an external contract, that's, I guess that's how it happens, and then and the answer is yes, okay. So it's just a matter of uh, writing your invariant in such a way that it covers the spec, I, I, I presume. Yes. Got it, got it, lovely. 
Um, well, um, I, I guess we are also out of questions. So any last questions in, before we... Uh, oh, Salim, uh, feel free to admit yourself and ask questions. Yes, hello guys. Uh, nice to see you again. Uh, I have a question about um, the verification of uh, smart multiple smart contracts that uh, call each other. Uh, sorry if that was all, already in the presentation. I was also doing other tasks. Uh, so is it, for example, uh, like you said, uh, um, Moody or Alex, there are uh, complex smart contracts that call other smart contracts and so on. So is the formal verification also jumping from uh, one call? So does it verify? I don't know if it's a stupid question, but does it verify also uh, the, the yeah the call to to the other smart contract so that would be a transaction I assume um, or yeah, a, a call so uh, and the, the, can it can it trace this uh, um, long chain of processes so it's like yeah. uh, I'm thinking like microservices so it's difficult to test microservices because a lot of calls and asynchronous and so on and so on. Uh, so uh, yeah, our tool works with multiple contracts. In fact, most uh, projects that we work on in the real world are not sim single contracts. They are multiple contract setups. And uh, there are ways in which we handle that. If we have exact implementations to call to contracts where we have calls going, uh, we can link those external contracts with the contract that we are trying to verify. And the tool will be able to handle that easily because it knows exactly how to handle those external calls. There could be cases where you don't know what the exact uh, implementation of that external contract is. Like you could be dealing with certain interfaces where you don't know what the exact implementation is on the other side. In that case, we can we have a few different approaches. We can uh, we can uh, give the contract uh, a few a few different implement implementations, the samples to work with. It can check with a bunch of different implementations, or it can it can assume a certain behavior from that uh, from that external call if you are sure about. Uh, or if you if you're trying to verify a property which only cares about maybe the return being true or some number being greater than a certain value, if if that sort of an approximation is okay, then we can summarize these external function calls. Or we or or if we don't know anything about that external call and we don't have the implementation, then we can and then the the default behavior of the tool is to uh, assume that anything can happen. We we call it havocing where it will uh, consider all possible cases. But yes, uh, the tool is capable of handling multiple contracts. And uh, uh, depending on uh, your access to those uh, the, and the actual implementation of those contracts, the tool can handle all the scenarios. But as Muli said, it's a very difficult mathematical problem. Uh, the more complex these uh, interactions get, uh, you're calling into another contract, which might call other functions within itself, might have a lot of math. So it, it could cause problems for the tool in terms of computational difficulty, but it is capable of handling it. I, I think also, I, I'm not a solidity expert, I imagine Alex, but things like delegate call, uh, I think are very complex in the code. That's why we want to build this extra layer, you see it, this foresight, that basically, Call the same tool, but later in the in the thing because we operate on the EVM. Sometimes the sometimes the we make certain assumptions. Like usually you engage with us. Usually the team engage with us either self serve or full serve before the code is deployed. So we uh, and but it's interesting also to of course check the code after it's deployed. That's also interesting. It's not. Thank you for the explanation. Thank you. Uh, and um, for those who would like to learn uh, of uh, how to use Satora approval, there's a, the GitHub is github.com slash Satora slash tutorials. And um, Uri is also in our uh, IFKL uh, Telegram group. So uh, feel free to ask questions in the group and I'm sure he's more than happy to answer all your questions. Um, we are- Maybe, I don't know, I'll share with Uri, but some people I saw in the, in the text that they want the slide, it's fine. I will share with Uri and Maybe you can share it on Telegram. If, and also, if you want to have other information, reach Alex or Uri and me, we will help you. Uh, it's a, it's a, it, we can give you more information and more, more available information. And please, uh, yeah, thank you.
thank you for the offer. And uh, I, I, I am sure, I'm hope that everyone will take advantage and uh, learn something and uh, do foreign education for yourself. Uh, we are 9.25, at least Malaysia time, five more minutes. Um, any more questions? And if not, I would like to remind, okay, before I, before I uh, officially end this, I would like to remind everyone that we have an upcoming uh, note workshop. Uh, it's a offline, that means in-person workshop that goes through a setting up of a simple Ethereum node and how you can contribute to the, um, the client diversity uh, of, uh, of Ethereum network. So uh, for those who have signed up, um, see you there. And uh, for those who have not, I'm pretty, I think it's recorded, so check it out in the YouTube. So as similar to, to, the, to this talk, it will also be recorded and uploaded to YouTube. So um, just for those who do not know our, where our, our channel name, just go to youtube.com uh, and search Ethereum Malaysia, and uh, you will see that uh, this recording will appear uh, pretty soon. And I will, of course, remind everyone uh, by sharing the link in the, in, the, in the Telegram group afterwards. And yeah, that's all. And I will, any, any last words from uh, Muli and Alex, or probably Uri? Uri, do you want to say something? Uh, any last words for, for, for uh, the community and... Uh, yeah. Thanks for having us. Um, we're happy to answer your questions. And uh, yeah, please reach out and try it. It's a new exciting technology. Thank you, Uri. And yeah, uh, I would like to personally, uh, I would like to personally uh, thanks Satori team, Muli, Alex, and Uri, for taking your precious time uh, to share this wonderful technology uh, to the Malaysian community. And uh, it's something that I'm personally very interested in. And uh, thank you so much uh, for doing this. And uh, yeah, that's all for me. Thank you Thanks very much for having us. Thank you. So I'm going to...